गॉड अवतार मेहर बाबा की जय अवतार मेहर बाबा की जय हाउ टू लव गॉड टू लव गॉड इन द मोस्ट प्रैक्टिकल वे इज टू लव आवर फेलो बीइंग्स इफ वी फील फॉर अदर्स इन द सेम वे एज वी फील फॉर आवर ओन डियर वंस वी लव गॉड इफ इंस्टेड ऑफ सीइंग फॉल्ट्स इन अदर्स वी लुक विद इन आवरसेल्व्स we are loving god if instead of robbing others to help ourselves we rob ourselves to help others we are loving god if we suffer in the suffering of others and feel happy in the happiness of others we are loving god if instead of worrying over our own misfortunes think of ourselves more fortunate than many many others we are loving god if we endure our lot with patience and contentment accepting it as his will we are loving god if we understand and feel that the greatest act of devotion and worship is to god is not to hurt or harm any of his beings we are loving god to love god as he ought to be loved we must live for god and die for god knowing that the goal of all life is to love god and find himself as our own self avtar meher baba ki jay jay great um uh, jay baba so we are continuing our journey with listen humanity we are in chapter 5 the chapter uh, is called lighting the duni at any time if there is internet issues um which i am on mobile internet and and right now it's good uh please move to reading and uh, ravi yeah, ravi can take it up from the point that uh, where i am leaving it the name of the physical page i mean the number of the physical page is 70 and hope my screen is visible to all yes we can see we can see it perfect so with that out of the way let's get started avatar meher baba ki jai um uh, lighting the duni the following morning which began the fourth full day the session was underway by 8 o'clock something of the holiday atmosphere of the first three days had abated and there was more of an air of sober men at work wrestling with a serious construction problem the first rash of colds due to the change in climate had begun to dry up and the regularity of nature seemed to have reasserted itself judging by the sleep rested faces on this day baba had promised to hold individual and group interviews followed at sunset by lighting of the duni a once a month ceremonial but first he must speak his mind on the overall problem of his work and the participation of his devoted followers in that work he picked several people from the group to sit especially close to his great armchair again and again on various occasions he made special efforts to show special signs of attention to different members of the group now this one now another the rowing finger of favor passed so indiscriminately that no sense of undue favoritism ever seemed to gnaw at the inners of the sahavasis perhaps the matter never came up because here for once in the world there seemed to be a supply of warm love sufficient to satisfy all there was a clearing of throats as people settled down into their nesting points baba cross sampled the group with his usual questions on sleeping eating elimination and general health the results were either statistically sound or else he had much on his mind for this morning he wasted no time in his brief survey wherever i go people flock about me by the hundreds and thousands that kind of love is not what i want whether people worship or vilify me i remain what i am that the whole world believes in god or denies him god always remains god i look forward to the love 
which enables the individual to obey me so that he may find me eventually and become me. Therefore, I do not merely want crowds to be attracted towards me. I want really sincere souls. I do not necessarily wait for them to come to me. I often go to them. I can and do do my own work. You can and should share it too. I repeat uh, this paragraph because of the uh, long pauses and gaps. Therefore, I do not merely want crowds to be attracted towards me. I want really sincere souls. I do not necessarily wait for them to come to me. I often go to them. I can and do do my own work. You can and should share it too. It is easy to collect crowds and it is easy for crowds to collect. My greatness cannot be established in the crowds and through the crowds, but even few with love can make the masses feel my greatness and keep the greatness established in their hearts. One single person who really loves me can move the whole world. There is no one here including myself, who can so love me. If all of you become my real lovers, we would need several more worlds for all of you to work in for me. My work for you does not Karthik. consist in going. Hello. Karthik. <clears throat> yep. So this Go sentence, ahead, this sentence, there is no one here including myself, who can so... I'm missing the script. Sorry. <clears throat> See this paragraph here? There's a lot to think about that. There is no one here, including myself, who can so love me. If all of you become my real lovers, we would need several more worlds for <coughs> all to work in for me. That seems to be a little complicated uh, sentence here. But Mamaji, remember we had the same issue uh, when Jimmy was reading this. We were pondering upon yes. this, you know. Yes. Maybe anybody can uh, think about this and explain. Yeah. Jai Baba. Jai Baba. I think it is uh, just showing the, the nature of reality that a true lover of God is available in the whole creation. And if there are more lovers, probably there are more creations needed. That's what he is, mm. I think, indicating. Jai Baba. To emphasize the, the reality of a true lover. Jai See Baba. the first sentence? There is no one here, including myself, yeah. who can so love me. Love me means Baba probably talking himself as a human being as well as God. So J hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Ashok, sorry. Yeah. So basically, I think he's saying the intensity or the desire to love God has to be you know, at the highest of the highest levels, very intense. So it's something like there's an example of, I think, somebody who's in the desert and who wants to have a, a glass of water or is thirsty for water. So he says it has to be very, very intense. And none of us, including himself, he, the God in the human form, can so love me. So that, that, that love is so divine, so pure, so pristine, and it's away from all uh, illusion or any ego or demand or any need. It's just love no material or any other need when I mean, you have to go beyond uh, the materialism beyond beyond illusion means there you only want one thing and that is to love him and that is very very difficult is what is my understanding in two cents i am open to listen to others yeah it's a good point uh, shok so can we can we say that including baba himself uh, cannot love him as a God, as he ought to be loved. 
that is the that is the uh, I think the inference or the intent of what this means. That's how I understood. Uh, maybe Mamaji, can, can you also come in? Uh... Mama is not there. OK, uh, that's what I'm thinking, Ashok. That's what I, I'm thinking, but that's really a puzzling. Jai part. Baba. No. Jai. Um, OK. Jai Baba, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, go ahead, Kama. OK, my understanding is that uh, when you look at Baba saying that even he could not love himself. So when you look at from the top, then God speaks, God, a uh, theme of creation. Baba is the first drop soul who became God realized. So he is one of us. Baba is the avatar, and avatar is God in human form. So Baba represents God, is the manifestation of God. But he's also telling us that, look, brother, I'm also a drop soul like you. I had to love God, which we know as existence, love, truth, which we can't visualize now because unless you become God realized, you don't know what God is. So that is why we have the guidance of a perfect master and avatar. So to me, it's very simple that Baba is actually putting us, as somebody said, like a human being because the avatar becomes human being when he comes down to earth in human form and he goes through the same trials and tribulations of course knowing that he is god realized and he is the avatar so from that point of view i feel that baba is uh, basically telling us that he is a drop soul and uh, he had to love the uh, he had to love god who comes in different aspects Mm. Yeah, that is uh, how to... I also understand, but I just want some confirmation. And uh, I think Ashok and uh, Kama also confirmed that. Uh, Mamaji, you are going to say something. Yes, that, uh, part, uh, that sentence, if you read, there is no one here, including myself. That is the physical Baba who can love me. That is the God. So that explains it. So even Navatar, as he has become uh, the drop soul, first drop soul coming uh, repeatedly, when he comes, he has two aspects. One is he is representing God. He is not the God as such. So he is giving a hint there here. There is no one here, including myself, who can love me. So that me is God. Yeah, this That's is the first time. What uh, makes me very interesting is uh, Baba always talks in a in a way that he is the God, you know, representing yes, God. But this is the first time. I am seeing a sense that he is talking also as a human being, as a drop soul. And then he is also saying that he is not, he cannot love God as, as he should be loved. And a different note, Baba always said, Mehra, uh, she is the one who loves how a, a human being loves God. She's a representative of that. Uh, Jai Baba, isn't it also a reminder that all drops, drop souls, and especially once you become a human being, because what is going on is consciousness. Consciousness has taken different forms. Mm -hmm what we call as drop souls, the consciousness of the drop soul has gone through different kingdoms, reached the human form and has full and complete consciousness, which means technically you have that super, but that is covered by clouds of sanskaras. So all human beings on planet Earth right now are God in human form, but not behaving with godliness or attributes of God. Simple as that, because of the mind ego. 
That is why you have Manonash, which helps you to reach that super consciousness or Nirvana. And then others who are destined will go to the next state of Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Jai Baba. Jai Baba. Come on. Very good. Very good. Yes. Now you may continue, Kartik. Sure. I think that was a very interesting uh, uh, discussion, and I think it is rather unique that uh, this set of usage of words has been uh, made by Baba. So, um, with that, I continue. My work for you, and I'm here, this, this is the point. Uh, my work for you does not consist in your going around beating a big drum for me. Love needs no propaganda. You need love yourself in order to propagate love among others. To spread my love among the people, you have to make them understand me as you understand me. For that, you have to bring them to love me as you love me and that means you have to cause them to feel my love as you feel it the best way is to show others by your own example how much you love me the world is too full of preachers and teachers never forget that i have not come to teach and i need no preachers in the intimate spirit of the sahavas I must be free and frank with you and tell you whatever I feel like saying. Why shout to others? Baba says God is the only reality and all else is illusion. When you yourself cannot help whispering to me about your own illusions. There are doubtless many among you who are sincere and painstaking in your efforts to explain my message to one and all that they should ignore illusion and awaken to reality. Yet these sincere workers do not hesitate to bring to my attention their own tales of illusory woes and worries such as Baba, I'm short of money. My wife is not in good health. I am about to lose my job. There is trouble in my business and so on. Would it be truthful for one of these to tell others? Baba says, do not worry about illusory things. God knows everything and God does everything. Why preach at all what you yourself cannot put into practice? If you do not find yourself free of falsehood, envy, slander, backbiting and hatred. And if you find in yourself lack of love and consideration for others, then instead of telling others Baba says this and Baba says that, you had best keep quiet and not show your face to those whom you would like to win over to me. Suppose one of my followers is speaking before a gathering and trying to tell them that Baba is reality and all else is illusion. Suppose that just then a telegram is given to him which tells him of a bus accident in which all of his family have been killed. If, in spite of the tragedy and pain of what has happened, he continues to speak with greater conviction, then he has achieved real authority to speak about me and my teachings. You win the right to tell others what you first accept in letter and spirit for yourself. Show outwardly only what you have won inwardly. There is no doubt, for example, that I am the avatar, the ancient one. But how do you know that I am he? You say so mainly because I say so. I say so based on my own living experience of being that. What? But for you, it is just a belief until you become me. Suppose your belief is wrong. What I want to impress upon you is this. Never give a twist to what you feel deep down in your hearts. 
if you feel i am the avatar say openly baba is the avatar if you feel i am a fraud do not hesitate to say baba is a fraud i remain unaffected by praise or abuse if you speak what you feel to be true you have the force of truth to make others accept truth honest differences between workers laboring in a common cause are signs of the vitality of the work but a spirit of discipline is also essential in all creative activities of life how can people work jointly without discipline and on the other hand where would there be scope for self control and discipline if there were no differences between workers your eyes ears nose and mouth are placed in different positions to serve varying purposes they also appear different in size and shape and yet all are equally yours besides serving specific purposes all your organs are also complementary to each other and in this respect equally valuable to you there is no question of one organ competing with another for supremacy of position or service to the body each serves in its individual capacity and all harmonize in the smooth functioning of the whole body differences between workers who toil in the cause of love and truth can either accentuate or mutilate them for other persons and for the workers as well therefore differences must be properly harmonized and fairly adjusted with the aid of discipline which is more to be lived sincerely within oneself than enforced upon others but neither differences nor disciplines should ever be raised above love and truth they should be sacrificed rather than be allowed to mar or cloud the main object a body without a soul is best buried burned or disposed off as quickly as possible no one would like to die to save one's eyes or ears a love your love for me should have free expression in the mode or form best suited to you it should shine through you to others awakening their hearts to receive this divine gift gatherings and meetings in my name should be a channel for the expression of my love and to give them any other importance is to misunderstand my case organizations may be necessary for carrying out work of a routine nature but if i am the avatar i need no such things for my own work although i would not be worth loving if i were not aware of someone's unexpressed love for me why should anyone who wishes to express it be compelled to do so through some office or organization my office should be the heart of everyone who loves me the heart of each should be my shrine and my lover the priest of that temple of love such a temple comes first and the priest afterwards a cart placed before the horse can serve no purpose love and the heart which has love are of greater importance than questions of the position or prestige of those who choose to take up my work a heavy railway train with two engines pulling in the same direction is quickly moved up a steep grade but a few carts pulled by two engines straining in opposite directions cannot make progress even on level ground forget the past and make the most of the present keep your own hearts clean learn to love each other first before you tell others about my love for one and all give love receive love gather love everything else is dissolved eventually in the truth of divine love let your own life of love for baba be the message of baba's love for one and all 
After this, Baba retired to the small building which he used so often for his private business or to rest for a few minutes. Soon, individuals and sometimes small groups were called in to have their interviews. From one conference to the next, uh, no one knew what took place with the preceding or succeeding persons. I pause here because a lot has been said in the prior paragraphs to see if anybody wants to discuss or uh, talk about something. And then uh, if, if there is nothing, then I'll continue. I think the, the whole paragraph two, three pages that you read is so profound that as a uh, human being, uh, uh, we are struggling to gather certain aspects uh, from these books, but it shows that it is so very difficult to leave that. Even if you gather a few insights here and there, to practically leave that is the most difficult part of the game. So we have to study that and then say internalize that and then try to bring it into practice. That is quite a, a task. So this should be in our back of the our mind so that uh, uh, reaching higher in the path is uh, a real struggle, everyday struggle. Jai Baba. Well said, I mean, uh, the, the exact things that I was thinking of was uh, putting it into practice is the tough part, so I don't disagree at all. Anybody else? <clears throat> OK, I continue. The interviews went on all day with a short break for lunch. As the sun began to sink lower in the hot afternoon sky, Baba and the Mandali came into the hall. With a few loud cries to round up the Sahwasis, the group gathered once again in the unusually warm room. Baba explained to them that they were all very lucky to be there at that time as it was the day of the month on which they regularly lit the Dhuni fire. This was a small ceremonial fire used in a variety of forms in several religions, which was lit in a small brazier just at sunset. Baba adapted the ceremony to his own ends by suggesting that each of the Sahavasis embody in a small stick of wood one personal attachment or characteristic which he was willing to give up and cast the stick into the Duni fire. The sun seemed to set unusually fast that evening, for as the fire was lit on the edge of the shelter where the feet of the poor had been washed, the figures of Baba and the Mandli grew into a hazy, unreal backdrop for the tiny dancing flames. Uh, this is yeah. yeah. The previous sentence, last sentence of the previous paragraph, seems to be the purpose of Duni very clearly. Baba adopted the ceremony to yes. his own ends by suggesting mm -hmm. that each of the Sahas is embodied in a small stick, embody in a small stick of wood, one personal attachment or characteristic which he was willing to give up and then cast the stick into the Duni fire. So this has been alluded to uh, in other messages as well. That is the uh, the the perp, uh, what do you call the message and adaptation of the ceremony for uh, Baba lovers. So this is what happens even to when you uh, attend the Duni, and I think uh, most of us might have got an opportunity to do so. Right. So uh, uh, something that we wish to uh, give up. We uh, use the symbolism of the stick uh, and then actually drop it into the fire, symbolizing the uh, putting it to flames. And uh, with that, we are able to symbolically give it up and hopefully give it up in reality as well. You know, a few years ago, 
I uh, I was in India, and then uh, my wife and I thought of make a quick trip to Mehrabad for a couple of days and then come back. And then we were able to go up to Hyderabad from Vijayawada. And in Vijayawada, I'm sorry, in Hyderabad, there's a big delay in the flight. And finally, instead of reaching in the sometime, sometime in the morning, Pune, we reached uh, in the afternoon, like two o'clock, three o'clock, something like that. And then there was a car arranged that uh, Prashant Bahi came and picked us up and then brought straight to uh, Lower Meherabad because we had to register. Uh, I'm an American citizen, so I had to register there before going into the MPR. And then uh, I registered. Then he said, well, there is a duni going on. Why don't you participate and come back? I will finish this paperwork, whatever. And then I went there. There was a big line. And uh, I was so tired. I thought there's no way I can stand in this line, go up to there. And then it so happened in front of me, uh, that librarian, what's his name, the Uttar Pradesh gentleman. I always forget his name, Professor of Botany. Uh, Pratap Chandigam. No, 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 no. Uh, Botany, he was he used to teach. No? He's from uh, UP. Both his wife and uh, he are uh, uh, professors there. Uh, he is in, in library most of the time. Okay, 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 okay. Mm. Anyway, he recognized me and uh, I said, just came here and uh, I want to attend the Duni. And he looked at me and uh, he looked that I was very tired. He said, why don't you come front? You know, uh, why do you want to stand here? He looked like very tired. <laughs> I thought, thank Jay Baba. And then he took straight to the, uh, to the Duni. Hmm? He took, he took me straight to the Duni. And this is the one I remembered. Baba said, you know, think about something and uh, give up that. And I was uh, quite blanked out. I had no thoughts. I don't know what to do. And somebody gave me a stick to throw. And then instantly I could not think about anything. I said, Baba, you take whatever you want. You know, I'm not able to think about anything. I'm just blanked out. I just rotated, dropped it, and I said, Jay Baba, and came out. I thought that was an interesting experience yeah. I had. Uh, <laughs> you were, doctor, you were talking of uh, Gokuran Srivastava. Gokuran Srivastava, correct, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. thank you, Sanjay. Yeah. Gokuran Srivastava. Jay Baba. Karthik, you are muted. Okay, I said, uh, I was saying, I'm sorry, I, I was saying, is there any other examples or accounts of visits to the Duni where we have been able to get rid of uh, any of our weaknesses successfully using the Duni or any other thoughts uh, regarding the Duni ceremony? If there are none, then we can go ahead. One of my aunt, you know, she said she dropped uh, eating karela. You know karela? Mm. So. <laughs> she won't eat karela curry. Maybe uh, she, she loves it. Uh, I don't know. I she think loves this... it or she hates it. <laughs> so what comes to my mind is that. Uh, say we have a belief uh, that we have to leave something when we go to kashi and come back mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, particular uh, things uh, they are listed so duni actually uh, tells you not to leave any material thing that's to uh, leave your attachment to that particular thing it's a plane higher to what is uh, 
say what we actually do in uh, uh, kashi we well need said. a particular material thing in our life uh, but we need to leave the attachment to a particular thing jay hey, baba jay baba so jay baba i have one thing to add and that is uh, it may not only be uh, you know your ego it could also be uh, well of course you can get rid of your lust anger or greed at the dhuni but uh, taking an analogy from the jain religion even something which you like the most say supposing ah. you like to eat mangoes well uh, for a certain period you can resolve that i will just give it away it's a uh, dhuni could also be interpreted as a step towards renunciation jay yes, baba yes yes so if that's the way to look at it i think let's choose carefully the bigger or the more uh, uh, than material obviously if you're able to get rid of uh, a weakness that's bothering us in a larger and a, a greater level than the material level is obviously more precious and yeah, important to get away uh, get rid of so i think both of you are right okay so um i'll continue the sahavasis formed into a long sinuous line leading to the concrete floor on which baba and the dhuni fire sat eruch handed each man a small splint of wood baba patted or embraced the man and then the tiny faggot was tossed into the fire it was quite simple the quiet one who was almost two thirds of the way down the line wondered why many of the mandabi were slipping into the queue to participate in the guileless ceremony usually one sensed that they had been through these things so many times with baba that there was little reason for repetition the quiet one thought thought over his personal store of stinky traits tempted to single out the most attractively disgusting one of all but decided to live with that one a while longer instead he picked the runner up his inordinate sensitivity to criticism this he determined playfully to embody symbolically in the wood chip he expected no earth shaking reaction and participate in the ceremony more on the basis of pen and drum etc well he learned he should have taken his tip from the unusual actions of the mandali which would have hinted that something of unusual value was occurring but no the sheep calmly walked down the ramp to his slaughter as eruch handed him the wood chip a brief smile of recognition flashed between the two he moved on two steps to find himself enfolded with unusual tenderness in baba's embrace and then he turned around and tossed the stick into the fire it was done and he forgot about it as he stumbled on home but god and baba had not the smoke from that one tiny bit of wood streaked halfway around the world and when the quiet one arrived the home arrived home a week later all hell had broken loose everyone was mad at him for everything he had ever done and for a few things he hadn't done as well after several days of attempting to calm people down and trying to reconstruct his shattered universe he suddenly recalled the dhuni fire what a sucker he had been or stopped had he if the stick tossed into the fire had precipitated all this then perhaps that loving embrace by baba held the antidote for weeks as the kettle boiled and sputtered he thought of the possible mechanics of this unusual thing that he had apparently brought on himself through it all however the warm support given at at the time it began it began kept up his i'll start again through it all however the warm support given at the time it began kept up his nerve i think there's something semantically wrong in that sentence through through it all however the warm support given at the time it began kept up his nerve as affairs gradually calmed down again he wiped the mental perspiration from his brow 
and wondered how many other unsuspecting souls had walked full tilt into a similar blockbuster. Eric, next time, whittled the sticks just a little bit smaller. Thuni fire died down and the blue car sped back to Ahmednagar to pimple down and the noise of the night preparations of the Sahavasis began to soak into the desert of stillness of the hot Indian twilight. Hardly a breath of air moved through the leaves and through the corn stalks and through the fingers hanging limply over the edges of mattresses. A long day of heavy work lay behind and the night was heavy with the static of it. So that brings us to the end of the chapter on uh, Dhuni. Any comments, any thoughts before we continue to chapter six? Uh, the reference uh, to Baba's embrace uh, as the antidote is a real takeaway from here. So if you surrender to Baba and put the stick, Baba gives you the strength to stick to the point of uh, relinquishing a particular thing which you have. Uh, left there. That's a that's a brilliant observation, and uh, and I think as you said, the summary uh, of probably the chapter. So, uh, in in whatever we do, if we do not uh, surrender and and uh, submit to Baba, obviously it's weaker. But in this particular aspect of uh, using the dhuni to um, get rid of our weaknesses one by one um, th there is obviously the role of baba as well so that uh, uh, we are successfully able to get rid of uh, that weakness anybody else and uh, feel free as i said to talk about your own experiences uh, and how you've been able to get rid of uh, uh, use the dhuni and uh, you know or any other questions in relation to this uh, chapter <clears throat> okay so then if uh, there's nothing else on this chapter let's go to chapter six um uh, physical page 77 some smiles, some tears. As day began to break, the air was chill and the breathless quiet of evening still lay over the rolling hills and valleys. Occasionally, a sharp dagger of sound pierced the soft cloak of silence and then was lost as instantly in its folds. The crackling cough of the night watchman on the hill rasped now and then and finally there were whispers in the kitchen as the first of the household staff arrived the village of arangao began to come to life and the lights of the tuberculosis sanitarium across the valley were switched off the cooks and the houseboys and the sahavasis at the foot of the hill began to cough and talk <clears throat> Suddenly, by co consent of nature, sleep was at an end and drowsing sleep-filled eyes were tolerated only in specially set-aside places. It was day and time for the activities of living. The entire world came alive with a rush and forgot that only moments before its nature had been the blackness and the weirdly moving forms of a dream within the dream. Breakfast was served and finished in minutes. Several buses were to arrive at 8 o'clock from Ahmednagar to take the entire group to Mehrab Zad at Temple Gaon, some 15 miles away from north of Ahmednagar. The dusty, rattling contraptions drove up promptly and the Sahavas seas piled in with gay spirits and ample buffoonery. Down the dirt and stone road between the pleasant shade trees, the cloud of dust clattered. Already the road was filling with bullock carts, bicyclists and pedestrians. India is a land of ceaseless tides of restless humanity. 
her roads glutted by a flood of people moving constantly to markets, to fields, and on business to the next village. But even these understandable, un understandable pursuits cannot account for the total motion. Millions more must simply be moving for want of a reason or a place to be still. All the buses carrying the Sahwasis sped towards Temple Gaum. An elaborate game of nerves was played occasionally with a vehicle coming from the opposite direction. The opposing drivers would race determinedly down the center of the road, honking excitedly at each other to give way. Inasmuch as Indian roads are often one lane wide, sometimes one and a half, but almost never two, the challenge was to judge at the last possible instant the final intent of the opposing driver. One who lost must take to the stubble, while the better poker player proceeded on the paved section without a moment's let up on the gas pedal. The game has many variations and is a fine source of excitement. The surprising part is the unexpectedly low mortality rate in such a hazardous form of roulette. The Oriental is by nature a much more intuitive individual than his Western counterpart. In some way, his intuitional feelers apparently bridge the shrinking gap between the two crash course vehicles. And in a quick play of personalities, the relative force of intent of the two rivals is gauged. As an outcome, both drivers are usually preserved to play the game again. Occasionally, the psychic interplay is not concluded until the last possible moment. Undoubtedly, this denotes two almost perfectly matched contestants. The result is nerve shattering for the passengers particularly those unproven in the razor-sharp school. In such cases, driver and passengers alike in both vehicles erupt into a volcano of abuse at the other driver, at his passengers, and at one another. The bus trip was quite, but the bus trip to Pimpelgaon was quite tame in comparison with a real roaring country ex excursion by auto, but it had its moments of thrill when oncoming buses and trucks chose to exert their claims or when blocks too stubborn to recognize any traffic rules heaved to the side at the wrong moment. Even so, it would have been a dull trip if it had not been such a glorious day and if they had not been going to see some of the most sacred spots associated with Baba. Just two or three miles short of Temple Gaum, the buses ground to a halt to ford a narrow stream. Shifting into low gear, they grunted and felt their way carefully across the gravelly bottom. The precaution was needed, for occasionally the current would unexpectedly hollow out a deep hole, which could easily break an axle. Beyond the stream and through a bit of forest, they broke into the open fields surrounding Pimple Down. They curved to the left, the village lying to the right, a low line of small huts and buildings. At last, they came unexpectedly to a halt at the side of a collection of strung out sheds. This was the back part of Merazad. Strangely standing out from the collection was the blue painted body of some old passenger bus. Several of the small buildings clearly served as bedrooms others perhaps as storage sheds and a garage or two. The whole was too complex to register clearly at a glance. Baba was there with the Mandali waiting for the Sahavasis to arrive. After exchanging a warm round of greetings, Baba set off at once to lead to show the Sahavasis the grounds and buildings. The large party strung out in snake-like form as Baba rounded the end of the protecting barrier of outbuildings which had first been seen and which shielded from view the two principal dwellings of Mehrazad. These were of frame and stucco construction, two stories high, set in magnificent garden showing clearly the careful attention of one who knew the soul of plants. There was a further fact which distinguished the garden. Each plant, shrub and tree 
possessed its own individual dignity. None was banked into an anonymous mass designed to achieve background effect. And yet, the overall impression was one of individualism blended into coherent harmony. Baba led the group into the larger of the two principal dwellings, built in a style which might be described as a combination of Spanish hacienda and California ranch type. The effect was charming, simple, and cool. This was where Baba rested at night. One could not have wished to find a place of more simple, uncluttered taste and yet showing no semblance of monastic austerity. One could imagine here scenes of simple human jollity, of pathos, of elation, of life lived to its fullest and yet stripped to its most enduring essentials. This was Baba, but it was also Baba suffused through discerning, feeling hearts and hands. Why try to describe in exact detail the furniture and the arrangement of the rooms? In this case, these are the trivia and the atmosphere, the all. One could feel human hearts opening out in trust, hinges of the human soul creaking into action that had long been immobilized. The weight of human hurry, uh, human worry lifting as if hollowed from within to an indifferent weightlessness. Here, the process of finding the divine within could happen even to oneself. But time did not stand still to allow the formality of endless speculation of the seed. Spendless, endless speculation on the seed. The human tide moved on through the quarters and around the exterior of the second house, now unused. Here, through the years, had been housed many women from the West. Baba led the lion of Sahavasis out across the cornfield and towards an abrupt hill that rose in the back of the property. As they began to climb seclusion hill, one of the young Sahavasis struck out from the sinuously winding path and began clambering directly up through the brush. Baba immediately had him called back and then admonished him. There is no one here who can beat me climbing this hill. But we are here together to keep each other company and not off on an excursion. As they came to the top of the ridge, two level spots could be seen, which were paved with bricks. One lay at the extreme top of the ridge, while the other was perhaps a hundred yards back and below. Between the two ran a narrow trail atop the slim, atop the slim spine, the hill failing, falling away steeply at either side to the gentle roll of the plain below. The two cabins built of asbestos sheets now adjoining the garden below, Baba explained, were originally built at these spots. When I used to remain in seclusion in the cabin on the summit, some of the mandali would occupy the one on the lower ridge. You can well imagine their problems, especially getting from one cabin to the other when I summoned them, often at night when the wind would be blowing furiously over the hill. Once I lived here on a few sips of water for seven days, I have remained fasting and in seclusion for much longer periods, but six of the days I passed here at that time, 1947, were equivalent to six months of my older fasts and seclusions. When I undergo suffering for the world, the load I have to bear is gigantic and affects even my physical body. I look then as if I had just passed through a severe illness. As the Sahavasis looked about them and at the tiny dots far below, a sense stole over them of events which towered into the sky and they knew as if the years had suddenly parted. 
into the dim future that on these two level spots where now only brick floors remained, one day shrines would rise as people commemorated and worshipped the unfathomable. Here I felt that I would wish to fall down and worship too, for the far beyond was mightily close, and it swept all about one and piercedly inse pierced insensibly to one's soul. After they had descended, Baba collected the group again in the cool shade of the garden, letting them quiet down of their own wills before he addressed them. Tomorrow, when you go back from here to your homes, some of you will take photos of Baba with you. But what Baba wants you to do is to take Baba with you. As you leave me, you should take as much of me as you can. There is no doubt that I am in you all. However, it is up to you to take me with you and to keep me with you. To come to me is difficult in itself. Having overcome this difficulty, do not go away from me for anything or to any other place. When you leave here, go straight back to your homes. You have come for me and you should go for me. If you leave, to visit other places and do other things, do all that after completing the circuit of coming and going exclusively for me. Whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly. Let there be no half-hearted dealings between us. Having come so near to Bombay, one of you has received a number of telegrams from business connections there. But I have asked this person to return home first and then return to Bombay. I don't want you to be half-hearted in your business with me. Uh, at this point, the, yeah. At this point, it reminds me that uh, we have a belief and practice that we, when we go to a uh, place of worship far away from us, we are supposed to directly come home, not to go anywhere else after that. This is a practice. Uh, going to a, a temple or uh, some other place. Uh, we have a belief that we should come back home, mm. not uh, go around uh, looking into other things and then reach home. So this is a, <coughs> a relationship. Baba is also telling the same here. That is yeah. uh, when you take up an issue or uh, uh, spiritual uh, say earning, earning so you have to complete it and then uh, imbibe it not just uh, go through that and then uh, uh, take up other issues uh, mundane material issues together hey baba yeah correct uh, when i was young a lot of uh, our friends when baba was living there uh, they used to to go to Mehrabad a lot of times and uh, Baba always would uh, insist you know when you go back home go straight don't do anything else and they would come back and used to tell us that this is what Baba told us um, so Baba used to insist a lot about going back home directly after visiting him yeah I continue. At this point, Baba apparently recalled that in the newness of the routine of the morning, he had forgotten to inquire about their sleep. During the past days, I have made it a routine of inquiring how you slept and whether you were all right. Some have described visions or other experiences which kept them awake. Some have said that they could not sleep because their immediate neighbors were snoring loudly and others could not sleep because they were indisposed. I have comforted in one way or another those who did not sleep. One person stood up once because he saw that I embraced all those who did not sleep well. Now, those of you who did not sleep or do not or who do not feel well should stand up and hesitate and not hesitate to speak frankly of your troubles. As a number rose from the group, Baba stood, stood up as one of those who had not been able to sleep. 
when the roar of laughter which greeted this died down, the usual person by person quizzing went on. One individual had a vision, vision lasting more than 12 hours. Baba did not allow him to finish this detailed, his detailed account, but motioned him to sit down saying that what he had been experiencing was good and that he was not lying. The audience was then told that this man had often been with Baba since December 1938, when as a boy in his teens, he had composed songs about Baba. Baba then turned towards him and gestured, now listen, whatever your experiences may be, there is no reason to beat on a tom-tom. Listen to me very carefully. When we narrate such experiences, we cannot help saying, I saw this, I felt that, and so on. And so one must take care not to let it get unbalanced and allow the importance to shift to the fact that I experienced this or that. For thus the ego is tickled and thereby magnified unnecessarily to one's own detriment. One has to go a long, long way to achieve the summit of self-realization. While trying to reach that goal, even rishis and munis are apt to fall through expressions of egotism. Do not make an exhibit of your love for me. It is, if it is strong enough, it will shine through simply and clearly. Of course, when I ask you, you must tell me truthfully your feelings and experiences. I like you. You possess a pure, innocent heart. Go on loving me more and more. To do that, you need not stop taking care of your own family. Also, do not get upset when your initial state of tranquility is disturbed. As the quizzing about conditions of sleep and health proceeded, the conversation was started with frequent outbursts of chuckles when matters repeatedly took a light-hearted turn. Although the air of concern of the ill or sleepless, sleepless one was deftly transmuted in each case into light-hearted acceptance of the situation, there was never the faintest suggestion of lack of full concern on Baba's part. The master psychologist was at work and out of the dull stuff of human troubles, there was produced a leavened loaf of full-bodied optimism towards the future. The quizzing and the sympathetic jollity came to an end and Baba turned his attention again to more weighty matters. Each time he prepared to discuss one of these subjects, its start was unconsciously anticipated by the audience and an expectant hush would steal over them. This would be one of the last, perhaps the last, of these discourses, and the men waited in keen anticipation for the subject Baba had chosen. Now I wish to talk with you about miracles. The matter is always coming up, and no matter how often I tell people that I have never consciously performed a miracle, these stories still persist. I want to tell you all very honestly again that I have never consciously performed a miracle. Ages and ages ago, I did perform one great miracle and the whole of this illusion of creation came from me. I will perform another such miracle at the time when I break my silence. That will be my first and last miracle in my present incarnation. Expect no other miracle from me and do not associate me with any others. There is a stream of letters from both East and West describing the wonderful experiences of people who say they see me and find that I do things for them or experience things which happen through my intervention. This is all news to me as I do nothing of the sort. But there need be no wonder at these things for people's own love for me and faith in me can do anything. Raval Bhai, tell these people what you have personally witnessed when your district badly needed rain. One of the Sahavasis rose to his feet and in a few brief sentences told of one of Baba's most ardent followers who had asked in Baba's name that it rain in their parched district. And to the joy of both those who wanted the rain and those who loved Baba, 
it had rained. We need not doubt what Ravel Bai says. Baba continues, he has witnessed this with his own eyes. But the fact remains that I did not know about this and I did no nothing to bring the matter about. I think where was the, yeah, so, so the line ages and ages ago, I did perform one great miracle and the whole of this illusion of creation came from me. That line is footnoted here as one must bear constantly in mind the context of my father and I are one. And this is again from the, I think from the Christian traditions. If I wished I could make this harmonium dance and play songs all by itself in front of you. Seeing this, you'd be sufficiently impressed to obey me, but your obedience would be towards the singing and dancing harmonium, not me. You should know two things which have happened during the last two months. In one instance, a dead child whose parents did not love me and who had not even seen me is said to have come to life again as my name was said over it. In the second instance, a young man who loved me dearly and obeyed me implicitly died a tragic death with my name on his lips to the very last. Let me tell you first of the so-called miracle of the dead child returning to life in my name. He recently received a letter from Hamirpur describing this event in great, great detail. A seeker after the a seeker after the truth by the name of Ram Das was directed by his guru to call on me at Satara during the, my last seclusion there. It happened by coincidence that I had sent for all the resident Mandali to discuss a phase of my work with them. When I inquired if all were there, Eruch had in all truthfulness to tell me about the visitor whom they had left behind. I then allowed Ramdas, the visitor, to come to see me, but only through one of the windows, and he was instructed then to go away. Shortly thereafter, he tells my followers in Hamirpur, he saw me in three different forms, as Rama, as Krishna, as, but I've forgotten the third name given in the letter from Hamirpur. Because of the vision Ramdas had seen, he went into the countryside of Uttar Pradesh, rather than to Nasik for the Sinhast, fair as he had originally planned. In Uttar Pradesh, he first fasted for some time and then began to spread my message of love. Ramdas selected an area hostile to love and devotion, but he prevailed upon the head of one village to agree to a kirtan discourse on spiritual subjects accompanied by music held in my name at the village head's home. It is said that he agreed he had agreed to this because one of his children was seriously ill and that his suffering had made him remember God. But let me say to you that one who remembers God in the hour of happiness remembers God best. My worker arranged the kirtan and in the middle of it, the sick child suddenly died instead of getting well. Despite the ensuing confusion, Ramdas remained steadfast and taking the dead child in his lap, continued the kirtan with even greater zeal and devotion, meanwhile offering profound silent prayers to me. The child returned to life before the kirtan was ended. Baba paused to let the audience absorb the full import of what he had said. Perhaps in some situations, a similar group would have cheered but these men had been long enough in Baba's presence and became become sufficiently conversant with the unexpected nature of his viewpoint to understand that even this great event was part of illusion. They waited soundlessly for the story to spin on. Because of this, thousands in that village and the surrounding countryside expressed their enthusiastic devotion towards me. But I say that this enthusiasm and devotion were not truly for me, but for the incident which had occurred in their village. Regardless of the fervor of their expression, it was not out of love for God, but for love of an additional illusion which had occurred within the illusion of their daily lives. 
Baba then singled out one from the audience who held the dead child on his lap. Listen to me, Ram Das. The child did not return to life because of any miracle on my part. Even granting that child really revived due to your love for me, this is not a great thing. The really great thing would be for you yourself to die in your love for me. Beware of your eye. Never let your ego feed on cheap things. Crowds easily gather around you, but do not let yourself become lost in the crowds, for you would be finished once and for all. Now, I will tell you of the second miracle which happened only a month ago. Some of you must have seen or heard of Navroz Ji Dadachan Ji of Bombay. He and his family love me dearly. His son, Norzer, died, died recently in a flying accident near Hyderabad. He was a handsome young man and deeply devoted to me. Besides helping to support his family, he also spent freely from his salary as an instructor uh, in the Air, Indian Air Force for my cause and in my name. He had called on me at Satara just before he went to Hyderabad. So the reference to illusion, which is uh, here, the really great thing would be for yourself to die in your love for me, is footnoted here as not literally to die physically, but to the importance of the world of illusion. But let's continue. As I had instructed him, he never failed to take my name each time before flying. This he did when he was leaving on a routine training flight. He and one another in a two-seater plane, and as things sometimes happen for reasons which will never be known, the plane suddenly dove straight into a lake, and both men were lost. Nasser was one of my gems. He died with my name on his lips and has come to me. The quiet of the group was profound. Baba looked very small for the moment in the silent garden, and yet something akin to a fierce pride seemed to burn in his eyes. One felt very close to the eternal miracle, and the sense of it spilled through the silent audience. The spell of human souls touching one to another lasted a full eternal moment, and then Baba roused himself to complete his story. At the time of the accident, I had gone on to Pune to rest from my seclusion. It was there that Nauser's family sent me a telegram with the news of the accident, expressing their regrets in it for such for disturbing my rest with the news. Such love is what I consider to be the true miracle, the miracle of love. Again, a moment of no speaking of the quiet, even breathing of the Sahavasis. Again, Baba plunged on. In reality, there is nothing such as death or birth. I know this and I say it with the authority of my conscious knowledge. We are all in eternity and we will always be there. Really, none comes or goes, none is born or dies. But to experience this truth, we must first free ourselves from the bondage of our ignorance. After a hundred years or so, you will all have dropped your bodies and yet you will still exist. Do not think about your bodies, but think only about me. Then, before you drop your bodies, you will be able to remember me. My miracle will be to make you become me. Although all of you regard yourselves as belonging to different religions, nationalities, etc., to me, you are all one. I have not the least objection if you go to meet saints of any religions, religious sect, Pay them your respects and remain in their company. They are all in me. If you feel that a particular being is a great saint worthy of your respect, why should you not serve him? But if you want to see God and become one with God, then the only solution is to catch hold of my garment, the hem of the garment. If you care only for God, and if you have the one sole sincere desire for union, God realization, then hold on to my daman exclusively. 
if you want things such as health, wealth, children, and other material things, then don't come to me. There are many saints capable of satisfying your desires, and they might be pleased to give you what you want. I am what they call in Iran a Shah Saudagar, merchant prince. I am neither a wholesale nor a retail dealer. If you are in the market to purchase a pin or a needle, you must go to a retail merchant. I am not dealing in merchandise such as granting favors. A Shah Saudagar can and may, if he likes, supply anyone with even a pin. But it, be, it would be unthinkable to approach him for such a thing. With this, Baba rose and walked on through the garden around the end of the smaller of the two houses placed in its midst and back to the road beside the long line of sheds and low dwellings. Here, the immediate Mandali slept while Baba was in the Ahmed Nagar area. Two of the structures to the rear and set off at one side were the reconstructed small huts which had been carefully dismantled and carried down from the small mountain. The blue bus body sandwiched into the lineup, Baba explained, had been used by him and the eastern and western Mandali in a long tour of India. Later, at Baba's request, the body uh, had been detached from the chassis and set up at Mehrazad, where Baba had spent the 40 days of his great seclusion in it between Ju June and July 1949, just previous to the start of the new life phase. After that seclusion at Mehrazad, he gestured, it took me and the Mandali two full months to arrange and carry out at Mehrabad, the winding up of, of my old life and to make preliminary arrangements for the new. Except for my future tomb on Mehrabad Hill, I gave up permanently everything which was in my name, utilizing the proceeds for my old life obligations before launching in to the new life. That's in October 1949. The footnote is reference to the old life Many old dependents were given gifts in cash or kind. At the end of the inspection of the old bus body, Baba told the group they were now to return to Mehrabad. He himself would come at 2.30 and after some Sufi devotional music, he would say goodbye to each member of the group. It was mid-afternoon and the strains of songs from the great Sufi mystics floated from the dormitory atop the old military reservoir. Each one in the room was trying to soak in the last essence of the occasion to stretch each second of time into an eternity that body, mind and soul might be wrapped in the endless perfection of the moment. The rhythms swayed and the bodies swayed and suddenly one young man of stolid mere dropped unconscious. There was a flutter of activity as restorative measures were applied. He was led in a somewhat dazed condition from the hall and the songs went on. India has developed its own knowledge through the centuries of the possible side effects of the man's search for his soul. In the West, the goal of the boxer is to knock his opponent into physical unconsciousness. In the East, the spiritualist aspirant might possibly lapse into a similar state of unconsciousness. The devotions went on, and at last, Baba signified that they were at an end. There was nothing left now to, but to receive the parting embrace of a goodbye. And this I shall not tell. There is, there is a time in human fullness as in human sorrow when the human soul must be allowed to sit within the privacy of its shrouds and smile or weep or caper as it may. They walked down the hill, some smiling, some sad, some still gently weeping. They packed their bags and that evening some of them left to go home. What had they left behind? What was this they carried in their hearts? For one week they had been with a simple man of great tenderness. He had laughed with them, played with them, prayed with them. He had been father, mother, son and lover. 
yet played on the strings of their hearts until their innermost beings sang. He had drawn the fullness of feeling from them until they had wept at the tale of nausea and the real miracle. This was a man for whom there was no description, who awakened in them things that could not be defined. He was himself, and in that self lay the secret of finding one's own self. No logic was of any use in describing it, discussing it, or explaining it. One had only the choice of experiencing it and being lost in the simplicity of it. Old men became like children, overawed and delighted by the presence of the true parent, yet the parent who at the same time was the child. Young, man, young men became old and wise beyond their years, with penetrating insight into the hidden springs which powered the movements of man in the universe. And they found within themselves the reason to be and to continue to be the sparkling streams of assured, unthinking hope, which is always the seal of youth. Who was this man with whom they had spent this priceless week? He was called Meher Baba, compassionate father, and thousands flocked about him at the slightest opportunity. But what did it matter who he was? What did it matter what anyone else thought or said? What did matter was this almost overpowering knowledge of having carved through mountains to come back to where one had started, one's own self. Now, it was a self which was real, friendly, believing in itself, no longer disconnected from other selves, a self which felt and lived and vibrated as the quivering reed to the tuning note of the universe. With its age-old knowledge, India had once more transmuted the individual into the self. A master alchemist had done it. The real miracle was that it had happened today in a busy world of whirling machines and the exploding energies of a giant civilization. But the greatest mystery, that of the self, had been exhibited once more in a timeless process which requires nothing but the touchstone of one who is already one with himself. These were the things that Meher Baba said and did with somewhat more than a thousand of his followers in India in November of 1955. If sometimes they have not been told in the same time relationship which they originally bore to one another, then it has been the fault of the one who has tried to describe them for he too has lay, labored under his own weighty notions of how the story should be told. All of these things did happen within the resources of memory of Ramju and the quiet one who were there and the swiftly moving pencil of the scribes, Faram and Kishan Singh, who were also there. This is a true description of what happened and what was said. This is a story of the human heart. However, the human heart is also closely linked to the human mind, which has a persistent quality of inquiry. Part two is now offered so that the mind may ponder and speculate on matters of great interest regarding the mechanics of creation. It is Meher Baba who now speaks direct, and that is in part two. With that, uh, I think we are just out of time. So I will stop there and continue uh, with part two from tomorrow. So any other points of discussion? On the true miracle, on the nature of miracles, and anything else that people want to talk about? I think today's reading summarizes the gist of Baba's mm -hmm. messages, actually. So <laughs> that's beautiful, yeah. especially the earlier part. True. Okay, Baba. That's why we call him Prema Avatar. Yeah. 
Same house. Correct. That is on love. Yeah. Jai Baba. Jai Baba. Any others? Any points before we wrap up? Okay, we are a few minutes ahead of schedule, so I, I, uh, we will anyway wrap up at this point and catch up tomorrow at uh, the same time. Have a uh, great Saturday. Yeah, go ahead, Mama. Uh, I have a query to all of the members in this group. Uh, prayer for Baba lovers. Uh, this is the prayer of uh, Daman. Beloved mm -hmm. God, help us all to love you more and more and more and more and still yet more till we become worthy of union with you. And help us all to hold fast to Baba's Daman till the very end. So here there are two parts. One is uh, uh, love to God. Then hold fast to Baba's Daman. So any inputs regarding this tomorrow morning from others will be welcome. Sure. I think some of us dropped off, so we'll start the day tomorrow uh, again by putting out the question. Those of you who heard it now, okay. please think about it and uh, come back and then we'll go from there. Okay, Jai Baba. 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 Jai Baba.
ĐỂ HỌ ĐẾN BIÊN GIỚI ĐỂ ĐÓN ĐẠI DỊCH